Jeremiah chapter 37, as we continue on in the book, and hopefully within a couple of months we will, we will be done, and we'll have a, probably a surprise for you, just keep that in prayer, what the Lord will have us do the next uh, book, and, and so forth, so the world is offering us as human beings a false hope, a false hope that is really temporary when you think about it. There's a lot of wisdom and knowledge in the world. I mean, there's some smart people, smart scientists, philosophers, and you can hear some of that wisdom and be pretty amazed at how they use that wisdom. I mean, to send a space shuttle into the atmosphere, that's pretty awesome. To have the technology to do that, to create a, a phone that does everything, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Uh, everything is done on here besides cooking food. I mean, it's almost there. <laughs> it's going to have a little mini microwave and just put it over your food and it cooks it right there on the spot. And just watch and see. You know, it's pretty amazing what wisdom is out there and knowledge. Uh, I was watching this uh, science program on tv is or the channel it's called science i don't know if the charter i don't think offers it or if it does it's on uh, one of the more expensive uh, channels but there's a program that talks about how we make things and it was pretty amazing how they make certain things what goes into the whole process of making a shoe just a tennis shoe and they start from square one where an individual gets a, a piece of cloth and he has a little outline mold and he puts it on the cloth and he outlines it and so forth and then he cuts it all out and then once he cuts it all out he sends it to the next person next person and it's this whole process to make a shoe and it's pretty amazing comes out with one of the most comfortable shoes that there is today and I can now understand why shoes are a hundred to two hundred dollars you know a pair but amazing when you when you watch this show uh, the whole bales you, you ever see uh, hay out in the fields now and they're circles? They're no longer square stacks. They have a machine that does that. I, mean, I want to know who the guy was that sat there and thought about this and how to make this machine that somehow sucks in the hay and he puts this uh, bar down the center that has like a tiller, but the tiller points in so whatever hay comes in, it wants to go f- center and not to the size of shootout just to think of that alone was pretty amazing and then out comes this round barrel of hay which is more efficient uh, they say because it's round it doesn't uh, mold because of moisture and so forth so just amazing and you go wow that's some great wisdom these guys are smart but when you compare the world's wisdom with god's it's nothing it is nothing And so we're going to talk a little bit about that, that we can hope in God because God's wisdom is far beyond ours. God's wisdom definitely is not temporal. It is everlasting. Uh, Not only did he uh, create the men that created the instruments, but he created the universe and everything that holds it together. And that's pretty awesome. So you serve an awesome God, don't you? You serve a big God. And we make him so little because of our lack of faith or our lack of trust. Or because we're in a situation and he's not answering us right away. Because we're, we're suffering or we have doubts or we have concerns or worries. No, we serve a huge God and he's working all those little minute things out in our own lives. And we can truly trust him. So now as we begin these new chapters, uh, we kind of take a step back in time here. Chapters 37 through 39 return to that uh, siege uh, by Babylon that is surrounding Jerusalem. It actually takes us back to chapter 34. Remember, we're not going in a chronological order. Jeremiah doesn't give us a chronological order. He's bouncing all over the place. And so he goes back to chapter 34 where this siege is against uh, Jerusalem there and Judah. They're surrounding him, uh, surrounding the cities, and they're basically waiting them out. And then hopefully all their supplies will be used up. They'll start starving and then they'll open up the gates and they'll surrender and then Babylon will just come in and, and take them over. And, and so we're at that point there. And then Egypt is also a part of the situation where Egypt then begins to uh, take the opportunity to attack uh, Babylon or at least to make their face known. And then Babylon then retreats from Jerusalem and then goes and takes care of Egypt. And at that moment, it seems like it seems like Jerusalem is saved. 
They have a time where, where Babylon is retreating and they're thinking, okay, we're safe now. Everything's going to be okay. And there's this false sense of security there. And so they're going to inquire of um, Jeremiah uh, concerning that span of safetyness that they see. So, so really um, what they need to do is hope in God. Hope in God, not in the Egyptians because they're putting their trust in Egypt, which is a type of the world its strength, its philosophy, its wisdom, and really what we need to do is hope in God and not in this world. So we see Zedekiah, King Zedekiah's vain hope here in verse 1. Then King Zedekiah, the son of uh, Josiah, <clears throat> reigned instead of Coniah, who was also known as uh, Jekylchin, who was a king, the son of Jehoiakim, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Balaam, Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land gave heed to the word of the Lord which he spoke by the prophet Jeremiah. Now there had been a, a change of kings at this time. Um, Jehokim basically was in exile. And there was a question asked a couple of weeks ago about who is Zedekiah? Well, he is the last reigning king of Jerusalem and Judea, but he was actually appointed by uh, Nebuchadnezzar in a sense because there was a void there because of the other king leaving and so in a sense he, he was appointed by them put there as a puppet so that they can con control him a little bit but they were still having a little bit struggles with him and so he gets appointed king there and of course uh, Jeremiah is preaching the message that destruction is coming and the people uh, basically are closing their ears to Jeremiah and thus closing their ears to God that they just don't believe that it's coming. Uh, we kind of live in that world today, right? Uh, we're kind of sharing that the world's coming to an end and the world's saying, oh, we got a long time to go. So we've got to store our resources. We've got to protect our resources. We've got to uh, bring population down so we have millions and millions of years to go in time for our children and so forth. And they're gearing up for all of that. You know, global warming, overpopulation, food uh, shortage and, and various things like that. They're not thinking of, uh, of the world ending. Yet it's so funny because Hollywood is. They're, they're taking advantage of that whole thought. And there are a lot of movies that are coming out about the world ending. You know? And it's almost like they're mocking it and laughing about it because they just don't really, really believe it. Do we believe that, that the world's coming to an end? I, mean, I think all the signs are there. We know that the Bible says it will eventually when that day or hour we don't know jesus said no man knows the day or the hour but as we look around us it, it looks pretty close to me and, and when you start having people that are high up there in christianity figures that everybody knows not just the christian world but outside the christian world that are talking about that you know you, you need to really pay attention at what's going on in the world <clears throat> so king zedekiah asked jeremiah to pray to ask God to find out what is uh, going to happen to them again. And Zedekiah the king sent uh, Jehuchal, the son of Shelemai, and Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Pray now to the Lord our God for us. And so asking for a little spiritual help there from Jeremiah, knowing that um, they don't have all the answers, and they're exhausting their revenues their forces and and possibly even their false gods and so they're just covering the bases let's ask jeremiah even though he's given us bad news maybe there's good news now that can come from him and now jeremiah was coming and going among the people for they had not yet put him in prison then pharaoh's army came up uh, from Egypt and when the Chaldeans and that is Babylon who were besieging Jerusalem heard news of them they departed from Jerusalem so so at this time Jeremiah has not been put in prison he will be uh, put in prison by the end of the chapter but he has the freedom to come and go because the Chaldeans leave Babylon leaves he now has the freedom to leave the city and go take care of business which we'll see in, in a moment here the pharaoh of Egypt, who is Hopra, and, and we're told that in chapter uh, 29, verse 2, and also 44, verse 30, gives his name. He comes out, and he opposes uh, Babylon there, and so they withdraw themselves from Jerusalem. 
And then the Egyptians <laughs> returned home. <laughs> then the word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah saying, verse 6, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to the king of Judah, who sent you to me to acquire of me. Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come up to help, you will return to Egypt to their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against the city and take it and burn it with fire. So there's Jeremiah's answer to, to their request to pray for them. Bad news again. And I'm sure they didn't like that news. And so that's probably why they are going to imprison Jeremiah there. So Jeremiah is warning them very clearly that Egypt's coming out is just temporarily. And that it's going to fail. And that Babylon will take care of them. And Babylon will come back. And they will besiege you. And they will take you. And you will go into captivity. In other words, there is no hope of escape. Even though you have a short period of peace and rest, you think victory is not yours. You will still be judged. And this saves Jerusalem only temporarily, giving them that false hope. The world can offer us temporary hope. It really does. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about psychology, not a whole lot. But we have this system that is out there in the world, psychology, um, psychiatry, uh, counseling, uh, worldly, unbiblical counseling that probably came up during the time of Freud. And I don't know if you know uh, the whole beginning of that thing. Freud was a Jew who then thought there's a, a way to oppose the scriptures. And that way is by us replacing the scriptures with our wisdom and our knowledge. And so he began to study human behavior. And he took the human behavior and he came up with answers as to why we do certain things. And that's why there's such a big study on human behavior. And so there's a lot of profiling as far as problems, as far as personalities, as far as situations of types of illnesses and so forth. And they just list them all. They have a book that lists all of the dysfunctions. And I don't know if you knew this, but this is interesting. One of the dysfunctions that used to be in there was homosexuality. It was considered a dysfunction. But then when they began to uh, grow in power, it was removed. It's no longer a dysfunction. Where they say now it's a race. It's actually a race now. So uh, you can see how culture changes things, how man's wisdom changes. But yet God's wisdom is forever. It's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It never changes. And it is way beyond temporal wisdom. When I was working for Southern California Edison, I had been going through some, some emotional things. Uh, God was, was moving me to leave the company. Uh, I was really not liking, which is a nice way of saying, working anymore for them. Uh, though it was a wonderful job and I appreciated it so much and it still, it still holds me up to this day, uh, my investments and so forth. So I don't regret any of that at all, but the Lord was just moving me on. And I, and I was just having some emotional um, problems with, with just some personal uh, people and, and just the company itself. And, and so I started taking time off. I mean, I had a lot of vacation time, sick time, and, and I just sought out um, help because one of the ways that you can take time off is if you have a, an excuse like uh, you're seeing a counselor, you know, and so you could do that. And so I went and I started seeing uh, a counselor. I, I wanted to see how they could help me. And so I went to Kaiser and I saw a, I, th I think they were psychology, a psych, uh, something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure which one it was. And so we sat there and she said, so what's going on? And she just asked me that question. So I tell her and she goes, oh, so how do you feel about that? And then I tell her how I felt about it. Well, what do you think you should do? And so I tell her, well, you know, this is where I come from. Here's my background. And, you know, I believe in the Bible and I believe what God says. She goes, well, I think you should try that. You know, and I'm thinking, that's what people pay for, for a person to agree with you? Whatever works, you know. I and mean, I think that's really their philosophy. Whatever works for you. Whatever you think and makes you happy. That's what I took away from that. In fact, I just thought, what a waste of time and money it was. Because ultimately, I come back to the word of God, and, and his word is true. His word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It gets right to the intent uh, in the marrow of the, of, of the body itself, in the heart, you know. And you can find peace through the word of God. 
But this world's wisdom is temporal. It really is. The doctors that we have, which are amazing, and, and the technology that's taking place, it's still temporal. Uh, they can heal your back, but you know what? It, it's only for at least 70 to 80 years, and then that's it. You die. <laughs> it's not forever. Uh, they, they make you think that you're going to live forever, but guess what? Joan Rivers and all the cosmetic surgeries she had, and even though she looked 32 years old, she died. <laughs> it's not a fountain of youth. You know, she died. It's, it's temporal. And we need to realize that. And, and I know that the church, I understand this completely. I remember when I first got into ministry, uh, Calvary Chapel, Chuck uh, uh, sent out a memo that we do not counsel people. We give biblical counseling. And you have to make that distinction because churches were getting sued. Because they were giving God's counsel and then, then the person didn't like it or something happened and they sued the church because you're not a licensed psychiatrist. And so you're, you're not someone that has a degree in it. You remember that time in our society where people were like, well, I can't really comment on that because I'm not an educated person in that particular uh, situation. And so they were making that excuse. But I can say this, <laughs> you know, and so they were just kind of saying, I'm not an expert in it, but I know this much. And so... A lot of the Calvaries went to, we give biblical guidance. And I still, to this day, I don't counsel, I give biblical guidance. I tell you what God's word says. And it's up to you to say, I agree with God's word and I need to apply it so that my life would get back on track. And, and most of the time, 99% of the time, uh, the problem is uh, lack of obedience to God's word. Uh, that's why they're struggling so much. You know, marital problems, it's because I really believe this and through experience and just observation. I think that marital problems, relationship problems, is because both parties don't want to serve one another. They don't want to serve one another. Such a simple thing of service and what service is all about. We, the Bible is very clear that we are to be servants, right? Jesus came to serve and not to be served. Paul talks about it in Philippians that we are to think of others more highly than we think of ourselves, right? And so it's about service. And so if you serve your spouse and your spouse serves you, you know what happens? You begin to grow closer together because now you're not just thinking about your own needs, your own wants, but you're thinking about hers and his and what they're going through. And you're trying to help them, pray for them, encourage them, be nice to them, you know, love them. And all of a sudden your relationship just grows. And I've seen that personally with, with myself and my wife. We are just having, at least for me personally, you have to ask her. Hopefully she won't lie. <laughs> but I have just seen these last couple of years where, you know, uh, I'm even more in love if I can be more in love with her. You know, I told her, I'm obsessed with you. You know, I mean, I just love her so much more today than ever before. She was just so rebellious. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, I noticed that it's because cause she's already done this. And it's this amazing. She's always served me. Always. I was the one that did what I wanted to do. I was the one that, that went my own way and didn't think about her. But I'm now realizing I'm serving you. How can I help you? What do you need? And I'm doing that more and more now, and I'm realizing that, boy, we're actually growing closer and closer together. It actually works. The Bible actually works. And that's eternal. That's eternal. That's good wisdom. And if we just apply it in our relationships, boy, our relationships will grow, and we will reflect Christ, Christ and the church, as the Bible tells us to. <clears throat> Jerusalem was only saved temporarily Egypt came in the world's wisdom you know oh, Egypt the world it's saving us great hallelujah but only temporally Babylon comes back and they will um, capture them and bring them into bondage what we need is we need God's help in Isaiah listen to this Isaiah forty four twenty four, when Judah was going to be restored this is what uh, Isaiah said thus says the Lord your Redeemer and he who formed you from the womb. Now, now, it, talk about creating something. We serve a God that created human beings. Uh, that 
machine that makes the 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 bays of hay, uh, hay is nothing compared to the design of a human being and god is basically saying look i formed you while well, you're in the womb i put every little uh part of you there down to the cells itself that's how awesome i am i am the lord who makes all things who stretches out the heavens uh, all alone who spreads abroad the earth by myself who frustrates the signs of the babblers and div div Viders and divinators are mad who turn wise men backwards and make their knowledge foolishness. This is God speaking. He's talking about the world's wisdom. Uh, at that time, the, the divinators, they were the, the ones that people went to. Hey, we need help. Would you uh, help us? You know, give us some wisdom. Give us some, some, some secrets. You know, pray over us. Let us offer the sacrifice. And they would divinate. And usually they were evil spirits that they were divinating. Which can seem very wise because demons have been around for quite a long time. They were with God in heaven. And they chose to leave. And by the way, that's a, a little evidence of Calvinism is wrong. Because they, they were there in the presence of God and they chose to leave. So they weren't elected, but they've been elected for how many years in heaven? So they chose to leave, and they watched man for thousands of years. And so they know a little bit about human behavior. They know how we tick. They know how we run. And usually it's the same uh, plans and, and uh, tools that they used against us. And God says, this, this knowledge of the world is foolishness. Their, their knowledge is foolishness. Who confirmed the word of his servant and performed the counsel of his messenger? Who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited? To the cities of Judah, you shall be built. I will rise up her waste places. So again, God saying, look, I made a promise. My word will come true. You can hope in me because my wisdom is far greater than their wisdom. Can't compare it at all. I mean, apples and oranges. 1 Corinthians 3.19, listen to this. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he, ca he catches the wise in their craftiness. That's pretty clear. The wisdom of this world is folly. Now, I understand. Churches have got into uh, worldly counseling, uh, a lot of churches today use outside sources. So they're outsourcing because they, these counselors, these worldly counselors, these psychiatrists and so forth, they understand that um, churches don't have the resources to always help everyone. And so they offer their services. So they will actually come to smaller churches and say, look, we offer services at a reasonable rate. We'll offer it to your church. If you, if you have a need for counseling, you can just send them to us and we'll take care of them. I've never done that because I disagreed. Now, I've, people within the church have gone out there because they're not trusting in God. They haven't applied the word and they're trying everything that they can. So they're going outside because they're just, you know, they're just really trying to hang on. And they're just trying, I don't care if it's, if it's biblical or not. I'm just trying to hang on and get something done here because nothing seems to be working. And that is so frustrating. The reason it's not working is because, again, they're not applying God's principles. And so they're, they're, grabbing for straws anywhere they can and that is even in in the world itself and yet god says the world's wisdom is folly is he really saying that i think he is listen to proverbs twenty one thirty: no wisdom no understanding no counsel can avail against the lord none at all psalms twenty seven eleven: teach me your way O lord and lead me in a smooth path, the psalmist said. Not teach me the world's way. Not teach me Christian counseling. No, teach me your way. Everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness is right here. Right here. We need to read it. And then we need to apply it. The, the, the commandments that are very clear. And then pull out the principles that we find in here. And apply them to our own lives. And you'll be blessed. I, I really believe that. When you read that psalmist, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path. A few things that we see there. One is that you have to be teachable. You have to be teachable. If you're not teachable, God can't teach you. 
You're like that student that, that goes to class and he's just like, I really don't care what you're saying. And you're just drawing on the notebook, you know, and, and dribbling all over the place and not really paying attention because you don't want to be taught. That's one thing that uh, a new believer, I love about a new believer, there's a hunger to be taught. It's so new to them, they just want to take as much as they can and learn as much as they can from the teachers. And so they'll listen to the radio all day, they'll read their Bible all day, you know, they'll, they'll listen to cassettes because they're trying to take as much as they can. It means a new life. That means that we should be growing constantly because God has to teach us things that we have to replace other old things with. The old life has to go away and the new life has to come forth. So we have to be teachable. We have to be teachable. You have to be teachable from God, his word first, but also from the teachers. From the teachers. That's why Ephesians says that he's what? He's given us what? Pastors and teachers to teach the word of God. <clears throat> Last year, I think I, I gave a message and I talked a little bit about, about uh, psychiatry. <laughs> And afterwards, a, a gal came up to me and says, I'm actually a psychiatrist. And says, my whole profession and all my, I got my master's and PhD and everything in it and all. He goes, boy, you're really making me think, did I choose the right profession? I'm like, well, you should know you're a psychiatrist. <laughs> you know, but she was kind of offended at first, but then she understood what I was saying. You know. <clears throat> Would I choose a profession like that personally? No. Have you made a bad choice? I don't know. Don't ask me. Ask God. I think that if you looked at it from the perspective of, can I somehow be a witness through it? And not necessarily, well, how do you feel? What works for you? But more bring biblical truths in there. See, I think Dobson does a great job at that. I love Dobson, and he's, a, he's a, into psychology and so forth. And I think he has a, a lot of wisdom because he pulls it from the scriptures. And then he gives you the scriptures. Though there's some human behavior that he notices in there from his schooling, and he incorporates that. And, and he tries to find that balance. So I, I like Dobson. I like his sincerity, and I like his approach to scriptures. I don't agree with him on all things, but I like a, a lot of the things that agree biblically, you know, that we can take from and glean. And it's worked because I've applied a lot of this stuff to my own family and to my boys when they were growing up. So I know that it, that it has worked. So I think that we need to be careful with the world's wisdom and we're not replacing God's wisdom with the world's wisdom. I hope I made that, that clear. So you have to be teachable. <clears throat> you have to be willing to, to say, Lord, let me understand what you're saying and let me apply it to my life. And then secondly, you notice that you must ask God. You have to literally ask God for that wisdom. You have to ask God for the insight. And then thirdly, you must be willing to apply it. And that's where it really all falls, right? Is the application. Without application, it's nothing. <clears throat> we walk by faith. But, but if we walk by faith, then we need to apply that truth. When all of a sudden something comes up and we don't understand, why do we hit this wall? What's going on? Why isn't this working? Where is God? That's when we say, wait a minute, I walk by faith. And so I trust you, Lord. There's a wall there for a reason, and I'm just going to wait here, and I'm going to wait upon you, and you will show me the way. I'm going to trust you by faith. That's what faith is. We, we don't know what's going to happen, but we know God's in control. If we trust God, I mean, we're supposed to trust God. How do we know if we're not trusting God? Well, we're worried. We're anxious. Uh, we begin to isolate ourselves, pull away from the church. I mean, those are things that are signs of isolating ourselves because we're not trusting in God. But true trust in God means that you trust in God, that you lay it all in his hands and say, Lord, I know that you have my life in your hands and you're leading me. You have my best interests and so I'm going to trust in you. Uh, I lay myself in your hands. I surrender to you completely. Just like a child trusts in mom. That child trusts 100% in their moms, if not more. No matter what's going on, they will run to mom and grab on to mom because they know mom loves me and mom's going to take care of me. More than dad. <laughs> More than dad, it seems like. That's trust. That's trust in the Lord. And we need to be willing to apply it to our lives. That's where our struggle really comes at is when we don't apply the word of God. 
I know that's where my struggle is, not applying the Word of God. I get into trouble when I don't apply the Word of God, when I don't listen to the, the Lord, when He's directing me or leading me, or He's showing me something new and I need to change something and I don't trust Him. Apply it and watch what the Lord does because the wisdom of this world is nothing compared to His. Colossians 3, two. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Now that seems kind of vague. The things above. Well, what are the things above? And what are the things on the earth, you know, that he's talking about? Well, I think he's talking spiritually here. And so the things that affect us heavenly bound. Those things that affect our souls, you know, our lives, our Christian walk. And so our mind should be set on God first and his plan for our lives, and his direction. Not on this world, and what the world is t telling us to do. I, I've said this for years. I yet to, uh, oh, maybe there's one or two, to the youth. You're going to be graduating high school soon, maybe a year or two, maybe even next year, maybe this year. My, my question to you is, why haven't you asked God what do you want me to do instead of making a decision just based on what you like to do? Ask God what is it that he wants you to do in this life. Maybe he wants you to go to Bible school. Maybe he wants you to be a minister. Maybe he wants you to be a missionary. But ask God. You need to ask him for direction. He wants you to ask for direction. Not focus on the world because everyone's going that route or because I want to go that route. Lord, what route do you want me to go on? Now, I say that because <clears throat> I had a lot of dreams when, when I was growing up. I, wanted to, I really wanted to be an architect. All the way from junior high, I took drafting. And I wanted to be an architect and design houses and buildings and things like that. That was my goal. High school, I took drafting. Virginia was in one of my classes, and she sidetracked me you know, with her blonde hair, her beauty. And I still wanted to be an architect, and so I pursued it all the way through high school. Of course, me and Virginia got married shortly after, and I had to start working in electronics. I even went to college, junior college. Started a drafting class. And I eventually just dropped out because I needed to work. It was too much. And I started heading towards electronics, electricity, and so forth. So I had to let that dream go. So I pursued what would meet our needs. So I worked for Southern California Edison. I needed to get some um, education in mathematics, uh, algebra, um, you know, all the classes there, ge ge geography or geometry and what's the other one, composition or something like that, I, you know, calculus, you know, all, all of that stuff. And I've already forgot it all. And so, you know, I just, because I needed a job, I needed to provide for my family. So I went there. And then while there, I get saved and God says, now I got you going somewhere else. <laughs> and ultimately, God's whole plan was for me to be a pastor. You know, not my plan, but his plan. And I wish that I was a believer back then because I would have said, Lord, what do you want for me? And he would have told me and I would have just phew, probably been here a lot quicker. But he has his way of directing us and redirecting us. But again, I'm asking you because God has to be active in your life. He should be a part of your life, your daily living. That's what being a Christian is about, is that he's there with you always and he's going to lead you. You might have plans. You know that most kids that go to college they change their major several times because they really don't know what they want to do. And when they get there, they change it once, if not twice, if not three times. And then they're under major or the lower major. I can't remember what they called it. You know, So they don't really even know, but God knows. And if we make him a part of our lives in daily prayer and seeking him and reading his word, he'll lead us and he'll lead us on the right path. Back to Jeremiah. <clears throat> He goes on and says, Thus says the Lord, Do not deceive yourselves, saying the Chaldeans will surely depart from us, for they will not depart. For though you had defeated the whole army of the Chaldeans who fought against you, and there remain only wounded men among them, they would rise up, every man in his tent, and burn the city with fire. So in other words, don't get your hopes up. Just trust in me. You can believe my word. So because of this bad news, 
that Jeremiah has, um, they're not happy. And so they imprison him. And it happened when the army of the county has left the siege of Jerusalem for fear of Pharaoh's army that Jeremiah went out of Jerusalem to go into the land of Benjamin to claim his property there among the people. So again, he has this freedom. Uh, there's this span of time because Egypt has come out, Chaldeans have left. So Jeremiah says, let's good time to take care of business. So he goes to the land of Benjamin where he's from, probably owns some land. Yeah, he's a prophet and God gave him some land. He can own some land. Uh, he can have material things too. He's got to survive in the world and he's got to take care of business. And so he's going out to take care of that business. Now, it's not the land that God, remember earlier, where God told him to purchase some land. That's not that land, but it's there in, in his land. And so it's personal property and it's personal business and he's, he's going to take care of that. Unfortunately, pastors don't have personal business. It's, it's like, it's very open to the whole body of Christ because what a pastor does, everybody sees. And everybody questions, why is he doing that? You know, where does he live? What does he wear? What does he drive? You know, all those things, but like we don't have a personal life, you know. Uh, that's part of the ministry. They did it to Jeremiah. And when he, he was in the gates of Benjamin, a captain of the guard was there whose name was Irish, Irajah, the son of Shilamai, the son of Hanani, and he sees Jeremiah the prophet saying, you are defecting to the Chaldeans. So uh, again, jumping to conclusions, not knowing the whole truth, you know, uh, questioning the pastor, questioning the authorities, uh, yet not having all of the information. Where are you going? Ah, you're defecting. Ah, you're with the Babylonians. Ah, you're against us. Ah, we're going to throw you in prison. You know, all of these con false conclusions, not knowing what he was really going to do, and that was just go take care of the land. So they take Jeremiah, uh, verse 14. Then Jeremiah said, false, I am not defecting to the Chaldeans, but he did not uh, listen to him. And so, Ira Jai seized Jeremiah and brought him to the princesses. Therefore, the princesses were angry with Jeremiah and they struck him and put him in prison in the house of Jonathan, the scribe, for they had made that the prison. Now, interesting how you can kind of see a, a typology there of Christ because Christ came and they misjudged him. They thought that he had another motive, that he wanted to rule over them change their whole occupation and so they imprisoned him they took him and they put him in prison there and that happens <clears throat> we, we still see that um, today uh, pastors and leaders and even uh, Christians who are going overseas and witnessing and sharing the gospel message who are being persecuted uh, and, and they're being accused of what of coming and trying to change their faith, right? Um, you're, you're trying to influence our people and what we believe, and you can't do that. You have a motive to destroy us. You're trying to cause problems politically in the government, and you're trying to topple us over, and just various things like Pastor Asid. You know, he's still in prison. Here's a young man who grew up in Iran and just sharing the gospel. In fact, he was uh, one that started like a hundred and more house churches when it was okay to do so. Uh, they they were allowed to do that at the time. And then uh, it was that guy, uh, Abim and Dad, came in and, and he changed the rules and said, no, we don't want anyone preaching any other message but Islam. And so he stopped. He actually went to the United States, got married, and then went back there and was building and helping with orphanages and not really sharing his faith or anything like that. But they remembered him. <clears throat> and so they took him and said, no, you're trying to, to topple us. You're trying to come in here and, and change people. And so they arrested him. And he's been there ever since, uh, being held for being against the government itself, which is our false accusations. They don't have any grounds for it at all. In reality, he's just trying to share the gospel message, God's truth to them, and they won't hear it. And when Jeremiah entered the dungeon and the cells, and Jeremiah had remained there many days. Now, King Zedekiah sends for Jeremiah here. And the purpose is because he wants to ask him privately uh, some questions and again um, not going to like what Jeremiah says and have any real good news for him then Zedekiah the king sent and took him out the king asked him secretly in his house and said is there any word from the Lord and Jeremiah said there is then he said you shall be delivered into the hand 
of the king of Babylon. And so the same message, it hasn't uh, changed at all. So still no hope. Um, God is still going to follow through on what he said because he keeps his promises and um, you'll be taken. Moreover, Jeremiah said to King Zedekiah, what offense have I committed against you? against your servant or against this people that you have put me in prison. So Jeremiah gets a little concerned for himself. Why have you put me in prison? What offense have I committed against you? Jesus said, tell me what I did wrong. And they brought in what? All of these false accusations against him. Oh, he said he's going to destroy the temple. (laughs) How's he going to destroy the temple? Oh, his disciples are de- breaking the law on the Sabbath day. And they brought in all these things against him. And he's like, show me where I've done anything wrong. Anywhere. So Jeremiah asks, what have I done wrong? Where now are your prophets who prophesied to you saying the king of Babylon will not come against you or against this land? <clears throat> and so their own prophets uh, were saying that uh, they were safe. And Jeremiah says, where are they now? Why aren't they Uh, here why aren't you inquiring of them Uh, interesting that this morning we were in our devotions and roman was teaching out of uh, daniel chapter 2 and the whole situation where nebuchadnezzar had the dream and he wanted the interpretation of the dream so he asked his his wise men what's the interpretation okay well what was the dream he's ah no you tell me what the dream was if you really know and then tell me the interpretation so he didn't say a word. And they're like, well, of course, well, how can we? Unless you tell us the dream. Well, no, come on, you're wise men. You should know these things already. And then, of course, they couldn't. So he said, all right, kill them all. Just kill them all. And he lumped everybody together. You know, just to kill them all. And so they were going off killing all the wise men. And they came to Daniel. And they're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Give us some time. Why are you in a hurry? <laughs> wait a minute. Uh, I know God. And God can reveal dreams. Uh, and he can tell you the interpretations of that dreams. And so Daniel goes to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm not telling you what the dream is. That's fine because God knows all things. And, and he knows the dream you had. And he knows that interpretation. And then he gives it to Nebuchadnezzar. Pretty amazing, right? How, how the world's wisdom is nothing compared to God. Because God knows everything. He knows the, our very heart and the intent of our heart. We don't even know that. What I found interesting was the fact that Nebuchadnezzar, um, it was what I found interesting, not what Roman found interesting, because his, his was on a different subject, which was good too. But I, I just thought it was interesting that Nebuchadnezzar went to these wise men knowing they really had no wisdom, <laughs> right? They couldn't help him. He knew that already. He'd been using them for years. And, and so he set a little trap. Said, I know they're not going to know this, so I'm not telling you that what the dream was. You should know this. He knew they didn't. That's uh, foolishness. And it's amazing how people, even though they know that the world's wisdom is nothing compared to God, they still go to the world. Well, I'm just going to go, who knows, maybe, maybe there's something I didn't get. Maybe there's something I missed, you know, maybe just one little chance and it'll save me. No, it's foolishness. You know, it's foolishness. Uh, God's wisdom is, is, is far, far greater. And so Daniel comes in and just, you know, boom, here it is. This is what you dreamed. And this is the interpretation of your, your dream. This is what God says. And then he tries, as Roman pointed out, he tries to thank Daniel for it. Wow. And Daniel says, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. It's not me. It's God. See, Daniel knew, knew who to give the glory to. And so Jeremiah <laughs> says, where are your wise guys? Bring them out. Why aren't you trusting in them? Why are you asking me? I, I think we know. I think we know that um, that God exists and that he has the answers. I, I even think the world knows that. But because of their love for self and lust, they refuse to give their lives to Christ. I was reading an article today. They're making a new movie, The Life of Paul, the Apostle Paul. Hugh Jack, Jackman is playing Paul. It's interesting. He was raised in a Christian family. His father was a born-again believer. He was divorced and he raised all his, himself and his brothers and sisters and he re- rose, raised them as believers, reading the Bible and everything. He said that his father took him to a Billy Graham crusade at the age of eight years old and he was so convicted at that crusade he went down and he accepted the Lord Jesus into li- his life. He said, I became a born again believer and I lived it. But then um, he changed his mind and became one of these uh, 
trans, trans, one of these meditational transmendental meditation. What? Yeah. And so he, he liked that and they asked, why did you change? He says, because Christianity is too restrictive. That's the whole reason. Too restrictive. And in my thought, I'm thinking, okay, so what churches did he go to? You know, it's so restrictive. What rules and regulations? That's why I love Calvary. There are no rules and regulations. We're just here to serve the Lord, worship Him, love Him with our lives, and express that <clears throat> through our actions and so forth. We're not trying to keep rules and sign some membership with our name guaranteeing that we're gonna you know that's all unbiblical there's no membership christ didn't, okay apostles come over here sign right here you're becoming members of my new sect so sign right here and and make sure you put you're giving 10 percent of your income to you know there's none of that that's something that that calvary says hey that's between you and god if you want to be obedient, then be obedient. If you want to be blessed, then you'll be blessed if you're obedient. If you don't, that's fine too. You know. But something triggered that in his mind, and so he says, So I'm I, I'm more into the transcendental meditation, you know, just kind of meditating and just doing whatever I want. You know? that, that's what people do. Because they're not having that relationship really with Jesus Christ. It might be with a church. And please, if you're having a relationship with Calvary Chapel, don't. That's not what it's about. It's about Jesus Christ and him. And people have relationships with churches. They really do. It's funny because when I got saved and came out of Catholicism, I thought, wow, I'm glad I'm out of there. Just like the Bible says, you know, come out of them. And I did. Oh, good, I'm, I'm in a Christian church. I'm safe now. The same thing's happening at Calvary's as it, as it happens in Catholicism. There are people going to Calvary because it's religious. We go on Sundays. We're not really involved. We go once in a while. We don't, you know, there's no connection. There we go. There's that connection. You know, and, and that's sad because I came out of a religious system into a, a, a relationship with Jesus Christ that had such freedom. And yet those that were born in Christianity in Protestant churches, Baptist, Methodist, wherever, and they're in Calvary, yet they're still in this legalism. And it's strange because I'll talk to some of you and even, even tonight, it's like, I feel unworthy. Well, yeah, of course, you're not worthy. I'm not worthy. Boy, that, see, that's the legalism that we're in because it's not about how we feel, worthy or not. It's about Jesus Christ. We're all unworthy. We'll never measure up. But yet God loves me. He loves you. He doesn't look at your unworthiness. He sees his son, Jesus Christ, in you. you know, well, I just don't do enough. There, there's legalism again. You don't, you'll never do enough. You'll never be able to repay Christ. In fact, if you try, he's just going to do more for you because he's never indebted to anyone. That's how he is. So it's a personal relationship. And, and I guess uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the Apostle Paul is like in the movies, Hollywood Apostle Paul. So Jeremiah asked for better, better conditions <clears throat> there in prison. Uh, so he's transferred to a court there in, in, with the guards and given uh, regular bread, bread to eat, at least for a while. Verse 20, therefore, please hear now, O my Lord King, please let my petition be accepted before you and do not make me return to the house of uh, Jonathan, the scribe, lest I die there. And Zedekiah the king commanded that they should uh, commit Jeremiah to the courts of the prison and that they uh, should give him daily a piece of bread from the Baker Street until all the bread in the city is gone or was gone. Thus Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. And so he said, yeah, I'll, I'll keep you safe. And I'll give you bread as long as we have bread, you know, as long as the siege is, is upholding. And if they take us, then you know, you're going to be taken also at the same time. So. <sighs> In our, let me just finish up. I'm going to close right here. In our relationship with Jesus Christ, <clears throat> and the thing that I find so amazing is that he's so personal <clears throat> that he gets involved in your life to the point where you're not seeking worldly wisdom. 
because you know he's walking right with you the whole time. And he's leading you and guiding you through his word and through the Holy Spirit as he comforts you and directs you. And there's a sense where you know he's there and that everything's going to be okay because he's there. There's a trust and a faith in him. And so when you go outside of that, you, you feel to a certain degree like you're betraying him. Like, why am I even seeking them when I know you're here? That's how intimate it is. Now, if there's, in a sense, if, if you're not and you're feeling okay with it, I think that's when you should think about something. I think you should think about where is my relationship with Christ and am I trusting him? Am I putting my faith in him? Or am I just trying to find help for my situation to get out of it? Because maybe God is trying to teach me something in this situation. And that's what God does in our relationship because he doesn't want us to stay the same. He wants us to replace the worldly wisdom with his wisdom, with his truth, so that we could be better used for him in the kingdom of God. Paul talks about growing from glory to glory to glory, right? That's what being glorified means. One day we'll all be glorified. The Bible says about gray hair, you know, there's wisdom in gray hair because they've been through life. And you, you can learn a lot from people with gray hair how they've trusted God, how they've seen God uh, work, and, and yet God has been so faithful. I'm getting there, I've got a few gray hairs, you know, and I've seen <laughs> quite a few things and gone through stuff, you know, and, there, and there's something to say about gray hair. And so we're going from glory to glory, and one day we'll be glorified in heaven, and we'll know all things as Christ knew, knows all things, and we'll have a new body, and there'll be no more pain, no more something, and we'll be there finally. And so we're growing and that's what Jesus is doing in our lives today. No matter what we're going through, God has taken us from glory to glory to glory. Let go of those things that, that are affecting you. Give them to the Lord. Let the enemy have them. Don't believe his lies. When you start feeling guilty, that's a lie of the enemy. Because he wants you to feel guilty. With Christ, you're guiltless. He paid the price already. His blood has been shed for you. So there is no guilt. In fact, Paul says there's no condemnation on you at all. And so you're free in Christ. And you can sense and believe that freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. Because he wants to keep you down and oppressed and thinking on yourself. Don't look at your situation. Don't look at your circumstances. Look to Jesus. Trust in him. The other, the other night, I started doing that, okay, looking at the church, looking at numbers, looking at uh, the size, looking at the fact of disconnect, looking at the fact we're not inviting people. I mean, just started looking at all these things, and I started getting overwhelmed. And then, and then people were calling me up, and I'm really saddened that, that uh, Maya's grandma just passed away, and then someone else had uh, um, cancer found in their body. And then uh, Beth's husband is in the hospital. And I started thinking of all these things. I'm like, Lord, how do we get through all of this pain, all this suffering, people leaving, you know, people struggling? And he goes, your, your thoughts are not on me. Your thoughts are on what's going on around you. You got to get your thoughts off that thing. Yes, pray about them and give them to me and then leave them there. And I re and I always go back, okay, Lord, they're yours. I'm not going to worry about them. I'm not going to think about them. We pray for the people. We love them, but I know you're doing a work in their lives. You focus on your situation, and you're in trouble. It's easy to see a hopeless life that way. Focus on God and see what he has for you. See what he was prepared for you in heaven and what he's done for you in the heavenly places, as he said in Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> so much more better and it gives us a life of victory as we walk upon this earth so trust in him there's hope in god his wisdom is far greater than this earth or our own